Well, my name is Dick Bernard, and uh, I've been part of the Twin Cities community f since 1965, and uh, in the peace movement for about a dozen years now. I, I became active after 9-11. My name is Mary Rose Getz, and my field was in nursing education. My name is Tom White. I am I just turned 80 last year. My name is John Noltner. I work as a professional photographer. I'm Mary Morris, and presently I am retired in what I would call a community volunteer. My name is Don Christensen. I've professionally been an educator and a minister. Uh, I'm a retired pastor in the United Church of Christ. And my name is Joe Schwartzberg. I've been a professor at one place or another since 1916. My name is Colleen Rowley, and I'm a retired FBI agent. Uh, my name is Melvin, Melvin Giles. Well, uh, it's no mystery. I, I'm an old guy. I've been around a long time, going on 94 years old. I have a personal project that I've been doing for the last five years uh, called A Piece of My Mind. Uh, very similar to this project, I sit down and I do a face-to-face -face interview with people. So we do the interview, I do a black and white portrait. So I produce these online as podcasts, I produce them as traveling exhibits that go around the country, uh, as well as a book. This is A Piece of My Mind and it's the book that I compiled from the first 50 interviews that I did for a piece of my mind. And really, I started this project in our own backyard. Oh, and since my retirement in 2000, I focused um, on, um, on how to create structures that would promote the cause of peace on Earth. And I wrote this book called Transforming the United Nations System, Designs for a Workable World. On the cover here is the system of representation in the Security Council through only 12 member regions, rather than enlarging the Security Council to add anywhere from 1 to 10 additional states. This would reduce the Security Council from 15 to 12 members, but everybody in the world would be represented, which, is never, which the Security Council never came close to doing in, in all its history. The, the vote that they cast is weighted based on their population and economic productivity, and the, uh, and what, and the legal fiction called, uh, uh, like, the, like the legal fiction of the sovereign equality of nations, the equal worth of all regional perspectives. So that's a, a new legal fiction. So I'm sitting there and being a marketing and sales and marketing executive, I said, I start, conceived the thought of a card that had all the one-liners they could ever use that they could uh, challenge anybody who asks them, as I have over 20 years, and every year now I've printed about uh, at least 15,000 of them that have been distributed around the world. And they're on how we spend our money at the expense of everything else. Well, the, the one that has been, uh, the way that has been most um, effective, uh, made the most sense to me, has been uh, active nonviolence, pacifism. Uh, expressed in active nonviolence. I'm an anti-war activist. I do a lot of uh, demonstrating and, and certain, certainly activate activism and, and otherwise I'm just a grandmother. Uh, most of the schools in Bloomington are peace sites. We talk about the five basic positions of, of what a peace site is and if you look at that, number one is environment. If they agree we need to talk about the environment, promote intercultural standing and understanding, uh, see, seek peace within yourself, uh, reach out to others, be responsible citizens of the world, and that's the essence of what we're talking about. I've, I've often said that we've <clears throat> we're a nation that's become so accustomed to war that we have really difficulty <clears throat> in, in, in changing the story to working for peace. Um, I'm, I'm a very peaceful person. I'm uh, 
the last person that you would think of as a warmonger, but my entire story is around people that have done things in, in war. I'm a peacemaker, I'm a child of the universe. Prefer smiling, prefer taking life a lot lighter. This here, for instance, is a small peace pole. I call this a peace seed. Um, it's like an apple seed, only an apple tree can grow. This here is a peace seed, and only peace can grow from it. Uh, fortunate for me, I've surrounded myself with good people. Uh, even though I did not know the man at the time, Dick Bernard, for instance, he's a good man. That old concept of Gandhi, if you want peace, you have to start with yourself. And so for me, having to start working on my own self and knowing that most of my anger, my resentment was towards the police or towards people who kept justice from me or, what I, or who I thought kept justice from me. And so over a period of time, I guess the work would be, was able to start transforming that anger and turning that over through love. And so um, created this group called the Peaceful Love Warriors. Um, and it was like we were seeking peace, but we was warriors. And, but we could only win overcome by love. Cops carry, they have bullets. And so I had to find me a weapon too. My weapon was bubbles. And it was one that was mutual. One of the early things was when I was a teenager, I went to see my uncle who had just come back from the war zone. And he was in hospital in New York. And um, he had had his uh, leg blown off. And um, there were, I was in the ward with these, all of these men who had been fighting. And he, they had uh, arms missing, legs missing. And that was one early experience that led me to believe that violence w was not the right way. And um, then um, my, uh, my daughter who was working for child survival was uh, very involved in peace and um, unfortunately uh, she was uh, killed by um, a man who broke into her hotel room when she was on her way to establish uh, a child survival project in Tanzania and um, so that was another instance of where I think um, violence came in and upset my life. I um, first learned of the World Federalist Movement when I was fresh out of college and working on my first job for the United States Army Map Service in Washington in 1949 or 50, I don't remember which year it was. And they had a chapter of the World Federalist Movement there at the church that I then attended. I don't anymore, but and uh, I thought, you know, this is a, an obvious good idea it's, uh, you know, that, that we need if we could achieve peace in the United States or a number of other countries through federal mechanisms, why can't we do it at the global level? So I became, I became a world federalist. Almost immediately on learning of the idea, it seemed so obvious to me. I have a lesbian daughter and I saw the oppression and she came out to me now 40 years ago, about the time that I left my job, 35 years ago. And she came out to me, so my wife and I started fighting for gay rights. Uh, that sexual orientation was included in the Human Rights Amendment in the state of Minnesota. There's a, there's a saying uh, that you shouldn't work against what you hate, but you should work for what you love. And while I had spent a lot of time being frustrated and angry at the process I saw going around me, going on around me, um, I thought that perhaps I could just direct my energy into something more positive. Uh, but I came to a realization that if we invest all of our energy in looking at our differences, that there's very little energy left to look at what uh, connects us, the common humanity that we all share. And so I wanted to use my skill set, my photography and my storytelling, to explore that common humanity. The sense of being part of one big human family, regardless of our differences in race or color or creed or religion, just as this family of mine. I became, uh, you know, this is serious life and death. 
you know, situation. 9-11, that, you know, 3,000, um, nearly 3,000 Americans died. And then we launch on to these wars where actually hundreds of thousands of people around the world are dying. You know, military, U.S. military is dying. So it's very important. And yet very few people are telling the truth about it. So that's what, you know, I wouldn't say inspired, but this is, it seems to me that we have an op, we don't have an option, that we have to speak out and try to get the truth out as difficult as it is. Well, success is always relative. My biggest success, but I, I suppose it's this book. I think the ideas in this book are my greatest success. I guess my ability to connect with, with churches and people to get an audience to at least allow them, whether I change them or not, to allow them to hear the other side. And we totally surprised the country and maybe the world in uh, winning marriage equality and the Freedom to Marry Act for gays, lesbians, transgender people in the United States. This is impact right here. Kids walking in, that's impact. The news is not going to say this is impact. How are you guys doing? It's a pretty garden. Thank you so much. You like it? Yeah. Good. Wow, peace bubbles to you. <laughs> My accomplishment has just been being loved. As far as stuff I do out in the world, you know, it's like, it's just bubbles, you know. I was on the cover of Time Magazine, a very powerful magazine had uh, three whistleblowers on the cover, and I was one in, in December of 2002. And so I think that really the greatest uh, success of this project and the greatest promise in this project is to get people uh, to let their guard down a little bit. Maybe, maybe give up their tendencies towards righteous indignation. And, and anger and take the time to hear uh, some opposing viewpoints. You know, I don't, I don't really think, I guess, of any of them as significant achievements uh, because I think that um, the people who have to live in countries where there's war right at their doorsteps, um, those are significant achievements. Eisenhower's declaration of May 1, very important. He, he, just, he declared that May 1st should be Law Day. And I decided, along with a few other people, that let's call it World Law Day. So that was important because we've been celebrating World Law Day for many, many years here in Minnesota and other places around the world because we started it here. Well, you know, I'm going to go with uh, the response that was given to you to that question by Lynn Elling. Uh, he couldn't respond to a failure question because he doesn't have failure in his vocabulary. <laughs> he really does not have failure in his vocabulary. It's uh, for him, and I've never really talked to him at any length about this, but I uh, agree with uh, his being is uh, in, that for him uh, it, there's never failure there's only degrees of lack of success <laughs> I, I think it should be unacceptable to anybody that you give up you never give up you just never he doesn't see that he failed only he would consider himself a failure as if he didn't try to succeed. Well, I think that failures, and I really don't even like to think of it as a failure. Yeah. I just, um, but I do think uh, if you wanted to use the term failure, is the fact that um, uh, people are not willing to. Um, to lose their, to move out of their comfort zone. They want to stay where they are because things are okay now. So why worry about what may or may not happen? So they don't stop to think about what could, or what they could do, be doing in a positive way to make sure that peace does 
and, and I think I, I pray this all the time. I pray for an end to violence in the world, especially domestic violence and human trafficking. And I think these are two big areas um, that we uh, have all over the world uh, where, um, where peace is uprooted and, um, and people, um, and, the, and the violence is there, there's no question about it. One of my big frustrations when I was president and afterwards was to try to have the Minnesota Alliance of Peacemakers, I emphasize the word alliance, become an organization where it would have some collective power, you know, working as a group. And there was not sufficient uh, interest to do that. It happens to be my biggest failure is not being able to influence my own church, particularly, and churches in general. Um, I think I think my my greatest sense of failure have come when I have personally felt uh, unable to to make the theory of active nonviolence that I really believe is, you know, I really believe in, when I have failed to make it work. In, in an institution or in a personal relationship. <laughs> you know, I, I think that 9-11 happened because we didn't pay attention. Um, because we didn't see what it was like to walk in the other person's shoes and say, how can we work this through? So um, this lie that went out after 9-11 was we, the only way that we can keep you safe and prevent terrorism is to do illegal uh, actions now. Start wars of aggression, uh, begin to torture, uh, indefinite detention on Guantanamo, spying on the whole world. All of those things are illegal. And they're illegal for a reason, they don't even work. But they, they, we were told, the United States was told, that this was the reason why 9-11 happened. And, and quite frankly, I like Mr. Obama as a speaker, or President Obama, I don't mean to call him Mr. Obama. I, I like him uh, as a speaker. I, I think um, uh, he was very motivational. Um, but what happens when you get to Washington? Well, it's very definitely a military industrial complex is, is the engine that drives this. There's a lot of money to be made in military things. Uh, ships, guns, uh, ammunition. It, it creates a lot of jobs. It's in every state. There's, there's no place where there isn't a military industrial complex kind of activity. Our, our war machinery or our industrial complex is set up in every state in in the United States. So <clears throat> no politician seems to want to go after how can we change that? How can we turn those uh, money-making machines into things like uh, clean energy and, and other things that we're going to need to survive on this planet? But, but my sense is that we have an economy that's so driven by conflict and the military-industrial complex. Uh, and um, in a capitalistic society, those dollars talk. Uh, I happen to think that we Americans are pretty comfortable uh, economically and um, from a material standpoint. And unfortunately, I think when people are uh, comfortable and they turn their attentions towards entertainment and uh, you know self-interest, um, some of these larger issues get lost. Here in America, I would say we're, we're very distracted by materialism. Uh, that seems to me a, a huge distraction. Well, I think Martin Luther King gave us a very good analysis 40 or 50 years ago, and I think it still holds today. Uh, he came to the conclusion late in his life, or at least he spoke about it publicly late in his life, that uh, what we see in the United States is the convergence of, uh, of three very, very powerful dynamics which are, are all 
wrecking great havoc in the world. Uh, and those are uh, racism, militarism, and he didn't use th this word, but, um, but I think he would have, uh, and that is predatory capitalism. So when you put those three together, those three very powerful systems uh, integrated, they, they wreck incredible havoc in the world. There's other things too. Distraction, for instance. So an issue that is not as important, uh, what's an issue? There's all kinds of issues that come up in, in elections. Um, jobs, I mean, the last election was about getting jobs and whatever. So people, you can, you can use a distraction issue so that people don't look at the real issue. And gaining control of most of the mainstream media so that they get the heads, the editors, and the major papers to go along. So you can hardly, yeah, if you publish something, um, like I mentioned, I got two letters in the New York Times about anti-drones. Well, that's a big, that's a big feat. And, and I think that the differences between the end of the Vietnam War and how that was ended and what's happening now, there's like three major things. They made, they, these are lessons learned from Vietnam. Our military industrial complex learned that if they had a draft, that then people would get mad as the years go by and as U.S. casualties increase, then people would get mad. And they did in, in the Vietnam, in the start of Vietnam, they were for it. And afterwards, the, the, the opposition grew because of the draft. The other thing was the debt. I mean, the, the cost of war. If you have to be taxed to pay the cost of war, in the, in the U.S. It's, it's somewhere between fifty dollars to $100,000 per family would owe right now for these wars. And if, if that happened, every, I mean, we would have 99%. The wars would end overnight. If a bill came to your house that you had to pay $100,000 to have the wars, and you know whatever they would end if your own kids were being drafted to go fight they would end so what are the lessons to keep a war perpetual war on terror going on forever take away the draft pay the military good money uh, so that they can't even complain even if they see it firsthand they can't complain because they're being paid good salaries and then you put the costs on a credit card so that nobody knows this the last thing is drone assassination. So this is now almost U.S. casualty free for the moment. And so the combination of those things makes that people can't care about doing much to end it. I had an argument with one that was the best peacemaker I knew. And he said, war is good for us. I said, where did you read that? War is good. Well, it makes our economy run. We need all the war, ma the manufacturers to make all the profit we do. We need to have, uh, we need to be in 130 countries of the world to provide a market for our corporations. Not knowing, and the lack of information is, not knowing that those our presence in the world is supported by 50% of our federal discretionary budget. 50%. Well, 6% goes to education, and we wonder why we're 49th in the world in literacy. I think part of the reason is that, um, we, again, it's lack of collaboration because we have many wonderful organizations working for peace but they're all doing their own thing and they're not trying to collaborate and do something collectively that will make an impact, a bigger impact. And I think that's, the, uh, for me, that's the big, one of the things, uh, and this is where I think collaboration would really work, to have the um, many peace organizations and to have them get together and, um, and work together to establish some sort of agenda where they could, as a group, make a bigger impact than individually they're able to do. They're all 
uh, they're doing a lot of volunteer work, but they're all off doing different things, you know. None of us are coalesced behind one thing like we used to be. Your question was perfect. Why, with all the effort by so many good people, have we not, in fact, it's gone the other I, way? I wish it, it's uh, almost an enigma. But I think they've all kind of given up on the, on the ability to make any kind of change. And I think it's been a result of the media, it's been a result of a concerted effort on the part of corporations to undermine a democratic society. It's divide and conquer. It's the same thing as the United States uses around the world to get splits between ethnic groups and religious groups because then you can control them. But they do the same thing on the, the population here domestically. So we have groups on the right and groups on the left. Well, our system wants to divide to keep people from having this consensus. Because if they have a consensus, it's pretty, it's pretty large. 65% or so of Americans are against war. I don't think there's a disconnect. I, I think we, we often fail to see you know, what's happening. Um, I think the social movements have always been the place where, where uh, change has happened. And that's the case today. And it will be the case in the future because it takes social movements decades to achieve their goals, but they are continuing to do so. So these things, uh, these things can happen quickly, but usually they don't. Usually they, are, they take decades to, uh, to achieve their goals, but I think that's happening, always has. I mean, has for a long time and will continue to do so. Although there are many setbacks, it does, it's not an unbroken uh, achievement. But uh, there are many setbacks, many very disappointing setbacks, and there always have been and always will be. But I think, as, as Martin Luther King said, the, the arc of history bends toward justice, and I believe that that's true. You know, I think that's a real perplexing question because I see us not going forward with much of anything these days. So um, I, I try to look at what is the distraction um, is the distraction that we're all caught up with surviving or um, we're worried about Social Security or health care or our children holding jobs. Um, there, it's, I think people are inundated at so many different levels and I don't think there's been a leader voice come along or leaders' voices that are calling us to a common vision that the world could be better. Um, it, it's, a, it's a quandary and it's a very frustrating thing for me personally. It's one of the reasons why I've tended to draw back from involvement. If I was going to uh, identify a single factor I think there are uh, power blocks, you know, pe people who can achieve power in a particular niche and have a lot of knowledge in that particular niche and are not uh, able or willing to compromise with some other power block that has some other kind of uh, special interest. Well, but that's going to change. See, this, this, this is, it's around the corner. You can't see it maybe right now, but you, you may be very surprised what happens a year from now. And maybe it won't, but it's going to move in that direction, whether I'm around or not. Well, that's what Gandhi said, you know, he said if the church was really uh, what, what I understand it to be, uh, I'd be one, I'd join it, <laughs> I'd be a Christian if, if uh, the church were followers of Jesus as he understood Jesus. So if, we, if people um, are at all interested in following Jesus, 
then I think it's an, it's an opening to uh, teach them about active nonviolence. And I don't see our religious leaders taking a lead in this at all. Um, you know, they're fighting all their own battles. Imagine just if world religious leaders got together and said, we don't want to see any more war. It would be phenomenal. Because as one pastor said to me, one I knew very well, and he said, I'll lose half my, the money that I'm collecting if I allow you to speak anti-government or anti-peace. I'll lose half my, my, the money that I'm collecting. And I said, isn't that just what you're in? What, why you are a priest or a preacher? I said, that's just what Jesus asked us to do. Or Muhammad, or whatever. People go to look good on Sunday and to meet their neighbor, but in between Sunday to the next Sunday, there's no involvement at all in the social issues. And we're supposed to, we're called to rock the boat. And we're not rocking the boat. If the church has lost anything, it has lost a heart, but I really think right now, I think the church actually is on a healthy comeback. Uh, I particularly think uh, the new pope is, again, trying to help folks see things a little differently. Thomas Merton says, one of the great problems of religion in our time, all religions, is posed by the almost total lack of protest on the part of religious people and clergy in the face of enormous evils. It is not that these people are wicked and perverse, but simply that they are no longer fully capable of seeing and evaluating evils as they truly are, crimes against God, as betrayals of the Christian or religious ethic of love. Please reach out to your neighbors, start with your family. Be sure that your family members know where you stand and what you stand for. <laughs> uh. This is a strawberry, still green. It'd be red one day. It's big right now. It takes time. It takes time. T-I-M-E. It takes time. That's true, and you have to see what they're up against. Their, their kids and their grandkids, which I have kids and grandkids the same way, they're all part of the environment. And again, these are powerful forces. Um, so for them to even listen to their own family member is going to be very difficult because they're, 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 look at what I said about the law school. So if you went to law school in the Warfare Symposium and you're spending how much money to get a law degree, are you going, if your, own, if your father or mother said, oh, that's not true, drones, I, I, you know, I, even the worst example, it could even be a, a drone operator who could have even been an insider saying, you know, I would hope you don't get involved in this, this is bad news. But if you went to this law school, which is focusing on national security law, which is a contradiction, uh, because national security is the antithesis of law. Okay, if you went to this law school, you got your degree in national security law, are you going to listen to your, your father tell you that this is a, a bad thing and wrong? Or are you going to listen to all of your teachers in the whole environment? I think what we can do and what we do do quietly and sometimes overtly uh, is just to, uh, to make sure that they're aware of where we stand personally. This is a peace pole. What's that for? It's a seed. Seed for what? To grow things. So you put it in there and grow? It will. With respect to youth, I was at a session at the Nobel Peace Prize Forum at Augsburg College back in March and I was in a session with a lady who uh, worked with Martin Luther King in 50 years ago and I asked her the question that, that, that it seemed like kids weren't interested very much in 
organizing things. Because that's, you know, my, my environment isn't around kids anymore, except very limited basis. And just very recently she wrote a long letter back to me where she said that isn't true at all. She said the kids are really energized. They're really energized in their issues wherever they happen to be. We just aren't connected with, with their way of, of, of dealing with issues. It was really a hopeful sign for me because uh, it's the kids that are, are, are going to uh, inherit whatever it is that's left from us uh, as time goes on. Hopefully it'll be something worthwhile, but they also have to assume the responsibility for, for making the world that they're coming into a good world or, or less than good. And I, I think that they're going to do a good job. What this process, these interviews, has done for me is to uh, renew some energy that I was losing to try to, you know, engage more actively and moving forward. I have a particular objective that I've been working on most recently and that is to uh, bridge the gap between older people like myself, which are mostly the peace movement today, and the younger people who organize in different ways than we do. You know, we didn't know of Facebook, for instance. Uh, we, we just didn't know about it. So the kids do things differently than we do, and to try to figure out some way of bridging that gulf. I think the problem is all of us, like me, are tired. We've had a hard time getting the youth to rally. And there are youth waiting on the college campuses to erupt. I just. I wish I knew how we could turn it around, but I feel that it's got to be turned with the youth. That it's got to be turned in the high schools and the colleges, because I think they've already bought us. And we didn't see it coming. In talking to young people, and that's our hope, I try to convince them that we're traveling on this beautiful spaceship and we're at this very moment, we're going 18 and a half miles a second as we spin around the sun. So we're passengers on a spaceship. And if we think of it in that way, we would never tolerate what's going on. We would say, this is wrong for somebody down in that part of our spaceship to be killing each other in the name of religion or in the name of a different in color skin. So that if we get young people, and that's what Gandhi said, that if we're ever going to have peace in the world, we've got to start with the children. Unfortunately, I think it's going to be a slow process, but I think, uh, you know, a daily, a daily effort to, to connect those, own, those issues in your own life uh, and, and develop an awareness of the world around you. Um, it's probably a longer time horizon than, than you or I will see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Our country, America, you know, there's been three countries. America, Germany, and South Africa. All three of them legalized slavery. All three of them legalized apartheid. All three of those countries legalized kill these people. With that type of thinking, it takes so much to change that concept, to change that concept. We see in South Africa, things have been changing, in particular without bloodshed, but the power structure is still having a hard time. I think it's all on the ups. It's very positive. My uh, uh, opinion is that Minnesota truly is going to show the way and they're going to show the way through what we're already doing in the process the school systems the people of worship and i'm hoping that many mosques and uh, shrines and buddhist groups the muslim community should join hands with us there should be no conflict and the fact that we we desperately need to have a peaceful healthy world for our children 
and our grandchildren. I don't, I don't want my kids, my grandchildren, and we've got a few that are, you know, very small. And I look them in the eye and, and I'm promising them that I'm going to do what I can until the last breath I got to promote this peaceful, healthy world. So I'm very optimistic. One of the outgrowths of this particular activity, these interviews, is uh, I'm going to ask the people who were interviewed uh, if they would be willing to get together as a group subsequent uh, to the end of this activity just to talk about what it means to them uh, and then maybe to do bridge out from there with with other kinds of formal activities to make it live on past just sitting in, at a table for a few minutes and talking about peace. I think what we should do is take every opportunity uh, to uh, speak about our passion. And it's not just lecturing, you know, the lectures don't do any good. But I think what you have to convince people is that um, action is what is needed. And it may seem like a small action, but I think the small actions do help. And I, I guess I feel that if people can bring peace in their own homes, primarily, and then, um, especially with children, I think this is what we have to do is teach parents how to teach peace to their children. And of course they do that in the home setting. And I think that's the important part to start, important place, I should say, to start. So I think, um, I think to just go and let people know that there are, are alternative ways to accomplishing what we want to accomplish. Um, and not just by com competing, but by collaborating and collaborating. And that starts, you know, certainly in the home and in, in our own um, lives, but also in the government. I don't think you can change po uh, public policy or uh, get peace unless you go out and demonstrate and there are significant, particularly, leaders of religions in this country to lead those marches. Now maybe that's relying on the old-fashioned way, but that worked. It worked with um, civil rights and it worked with the Vietnam. And so why aren't we doing that again today? Um, well, I mean, uh, what we can do is we can try to uh, help people understand who Jesus was, <laughs> what he stood for. Uh, I mean, I, I believe from reading scriptures and reading other people who've interpreted scriptures that Jesus was, um, was a pacifist. Essentially, I mean, he was. I think he was. Uh, you, you could say, you could build a case that he was a practitioner of active nonviolence in his time. Confucius say, you know, we might go slow, but just don't stop. Just keep on moving. We, we be reaching it. You know, so. People say there, are, you can't solve the problem. If you say you can't, if you believe you can't, you can't. And once you're in that mindset, you're stuck. You have to say, well, let's, let's, let's work on the problem and come up with a solution. I hope every May 1st, whether I'm around or not, the idea is there. And it, and it must be embellished to where we involve the whole human family, not just people here in Minnesota or the United States, but the entire spaceship Earth population. There are seven billion of us passengers on that spaceship and if we can't find a way to live in peace on that spaceship of ours then we have a real problem. I think it's better to live in harmony than to kill one another. It's pretty simple. The, um, the uh, I think peace is a prerequisite for progress and uh, instead of spending money on armaments you can spend money on constructive ends if you learn to live at peace with your neighbor. To me 
It's the survival of the human family we're talking about. That, that we're not going to make it. I mean, we're not going to survive unless we find a way to join hands. Uh, but I hope that that we collectively continue to find new ways to work together to sort of connect all of these efforts, so that it's not a um, so that it's not a million points of light, uh, but they come together into one large glow. You know, it, it it's not that I'm <clears throat> uh, totally disbelieving of our government around and everything. I'm not that kind of a person. It has made me learn that I need to question, I need to pay attention, I need to pay attention to what I read, who's publishing what I read, who are the writers of what I read. Well, I think um, my message, and you know, I wish the government, our government would, uh, would um, do something more about how it works with other people. Uh, the problem is, and you know this, I'm sure, um, that as, as a government, we can be so arrogant and feel, well, we know the right way to do it, and we're going to make sure that everybody else does it the same way. And that's not the way. That's not the way at all. So we don't think that arrogance has a place in, um, in foreign policy and uh, diplomacy. And I think that's it. I think what we have to do is recognize the strength that each individual and every country brings to the table. It's so obvious that the costs of war are so much greater than the costs of, of hanging in there and, and working for peace. The costs and the benefits of peace are so much greater than those that can be won through the agency of war. It ought to be obvious, but, but humankind has a rather sad history when it comes to war. It has to do perhaps with the genes of, of the male of our species. I don't know what the cause is. Thomas Jefferson said, if we are to guard against ignorance and remain free, it is the responsibility of every American to be informed. And above the door of the University of Virginia, it says, an informed citizenry is vital for a democracy to persist. What I like to showcase with a piece of my mind is really ordinary individuals, people who don't have name recognition. They're not famous, they're not in the headlines, but they have found ways in their own lives to make a significant contribution to society, to move things in a more peaceful direction, in, in small ways and for some of them in, in very large ways. Uh, and I guess that would be my message for individuals, that we, uh, we have the ability to make change and that I would encourage them to move in that direction. Um, I would just tell the youth that they should all um, try to, I tell, I've said this at, I've given commencement speeches and stuff, and I always say, you know, you should try to go to your highest level, uh, whether that means joining a federal agency or, uh, or working in a government or a corporation, um, do that. But keep your eyes open, okay, because all groups, even the Catholic priesthood, I mean it doesn't, even NGOs, even human rights groups, all can easily become corrupted. And so as you go up the hierarchy, you're going to see these things. And there does come a time when you have to speak out and, and or just leave. You know, if you just stop and think, um, I didn't want to see my children going off to war any more than people who are living in countries where the war is happening want to see their children dying. I didn't want to see my children dying. We have integrity, and integrity is a lot more than loyalty. Loyalty is, a, is, is actually a vice at a certain point. Loyalty is a virtue, but then it changes into a vice. And you have to have integrity to tell the truth about things. If, you're, if you get caught up in one of these bad systems or these corrupted systems as I think right now the United States is caught up in. So my message for folks would be to blow some bubbles, um, try to think about effect and cause, you know. It's like we are what we think and 
if we just keep thinking fearful and negative thoughts, that's all we're gonna see. So that effect is we have to start thinking beautiful thoughts. We have to start thinking bright thoughts. We gotta take the high road. The word can't, we ought to get it out of our vocabulary. There's very little we can't do if we have the mind to do it. Well, uh, my message is to keep doing. And if you keep doing, you will ultimately succeed. If you have a passion for something, uh, pursue that passion. And be willing to con uh, cooperate. And uh, another word that you should shun is never. Try never to say never. So I, my advice is step up to the plate. It's your turn to be at the batter to hit the ball. My country's skies are bluer than the oceans, and sunlight beams on clover, leaf, and pine. But other lands have sunlight too, and clover, and skies are everywhere as blue as mine. Oh, hear my song, thou God of all nations, a song of peace for their land and for mine. Teach us to sing of God of all creation, a song of hope for ocean, sky, and pine. Teach us to walk the way that ends divisions till every land and nation love entwines. Then will all people see your glorious vision. The world is peace, beloved and divine. We shall overcome we shall overcome, we shall overcome something. Oh, deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. We're on to victory. Oh, uh -huh.